If you like our content, please like, subscribe, and click the notification bell to get alerts when we introduce new videos. The 2.4 and 5 GHz bands are both unlicensed bands available for many different applications. However, for several different reasons, the 2.4 GHz band has been heavily adopted and utilized by both Wi-Fi and non-Wi-Fi wireless devices. One of the reasons for this is that lower frequencies have better range characteristics than higher frequencies when using the same power. So they are more useful at longer distances. Additionally, 2.4 GHz radios are normally less expensive due to their popularity. Unfortunately, there is only 100 megahertz of usable space within the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. Until recent years, 5 gigahertz has not been widely used by non-Wi-Fi devices. This means there is less contention in this space coming from non-Wi-Fi sources. The trade-off, however, with 5 gigahertz is usually a shorter range. However, as more users adopt Wi-Fi, and more devices implement it, shorter ranges actually becomes an advantage because it can handle higher density with less interference. In general, 5 GHz operation is very suitable for enterprise use and 2.4 GHz deployments are still implemented to support older clients or those clients that do not support 5 GHz channels. Additionally, 5 GHz operation is more suitable for high density deployments because of the greater number of available non-overlapping channels allowing you to create more collision domains with fewer stations per collision domain. 802.11 wireless networks are permitted to use frequency space ranging from 700 megahertz to 66 gigahertz. However, the two most commonly used frequency spaces are the 2.4 gigahertz space and the 5 gigahertz space. As you can see, some FIs can use both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, such as 802.11n and 802.11ax. The range of RF communications shorten as the frequency raises, as you learned earlier. The distance a signal can travel and can be useful is directly related to the power or amplitude of the signal output of the transmitter. The table in the top right indicates typical distances or ranges, but these are impacted in all bands by output power and receiver sensitivity as well as antenna gain. Just know that signals transmitted in lower frequencies use less power to travel the same distance as signals using higher frequencies require. Previously we pointed out how only 100 megahertz of frequency space is available to 2.4 gigahertz while 5 GHz has over 600 MHz of frequency space. This is important because it directly impacts the number of channels that can be used in each frequency. Although most people refer to the protocols used in 802.11 by their respective amendments, for example, 802.11b, 802.11g, 802.11n, or AX, the FIs have names which relate to their transmission techniques. You may see these names on modulation coding schemes and their charts. As Wi-Fi continues to evolve, the FIs should also continue to allow for increased data rates. Although outside the scope of this course, MCS charts can be very helpful. They allow you to see the supported data rates for each FI in a given configuration. Channel width. In 2.4 GHz, devices using direct sequence spread spectrum have 22 megahertz wide channels while devices using orthogonal frequency division multiplexing use 20 megahertz wide channels. The OFDM and ERP channels in 2.4 gigahertz can be bonded to make 40 megahertz wide channels. Since there are only three non-overlapping channels at most configurable in 2.4 gigahertz, you should never use channel bonding in this space in any type of high density or enterprise environment. 802.11 Prime, which is the name often used to refer to the original 802.11 standard from 1997, and 802.11b, which was released in 1999, use 22 megahertz wide channels for communications 
and provide data rates of 1, 2, 5.5, and 11 megabits per second while operating only in the 2.4 gigahertz band. 802.11 Prime and 802.11b provide no support for the 5 gigahertz band. Introduced along with 802.11b in 1999 was 802.11a. It was the first 802.11 technology to support the 5 gigahertz band. 802.11a and 802.11g, which only uses the 2.4 gigahertz band, use 20 megahertz wide channels because they both use OFDM, orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. 802.11n operates in both 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz and uses either 20 megahertz or 40 megahertz wide channels. Remember, due to the limited number of channels in the 2.4 gigahertz space, channel bonding there is not recommended. 5 gigahertz channels are considered to be non-overlapping. 802.11ac only operates within the 5 gigahertz band. When the phrase dual band 802.11ac is used in marketing literature to describe access points, it's truly misleading. What it really means is that such devices are using 802.11n in the 2.4 gigahertz band and using 802.11ac in the 5 gigahertz band. 802.11ac is also called very high throughput or VHT. It supports 20, 40, 80, and 160 megahertz wide channels. 80 megahertz and 160 megahertz wide channels should probably be avoided in most 802.11 enterprise networks. If sufficient frequency space is available and your clients support the wider channel use and there's a real need for it and there's no interference, 80 or even 160 megahertz wide channels may be used successfully. It is unlikely to see this in the enterprise though due to the densely populated areas and so many people adopting Wi-Fi in both bands. 5 GHz channels are at least 20 MHz apart. There's more space than this between the lower, middle, and upper range channels. The 2.4 GHz band ranges from 2.4 to 2.5 GHz. 802.11 devices in this space only use the range from 2.401 GHz to 2.495 GHz, but only if all 14 channels are supported within the regulatory domain. North America supports only channels 1 through 11. Other parts of the world also support the use of channels 12 through 13 while channel 14 is supported in Japan for 802.11b operations. For this reason, most 2.4 GHz networks in North America are configured to use only channels 1, 6, and 11 since enterprise clients can be traveling between regulatory domains which do not provide support for channels 12 to 14. If these channels were used, most clients from more restrictive domains would not be able to connect. If planning for your least capable device, channels 12 through 14 should be avoided. The channels listed as not typically used in the image are non-recommended channels and are considered to be overlapping. In some cases, they may be best for use, but in such scenarios, you'll find that to be a rare occurrence. Most implementations in 2.4 use a simple three channel plan of one, six, and 11 to avoid any overlapping channel interference. Unlike the 2.4 GHz channels, 5 GHz channels are considered to be non-overlapping. They are all 20 MHz wide and can be bonded together to form channels as wide as 160 MHz. Since there are more channels available in 5 GHz, there's also more complexity in operations and design. The complexity is sometimes due to the channel and power restrictions placed upon us by various regulatory domains. For example, channels 52 through 144 are considered to be dynamic frequency selection channels in most of the world. DFS requires any radios using this specified space to scan for other designated uses of these channels and move away from these channels if they are detected. DFS will be discussed later in the course. Channel widths of 160 and 80 MHz and 40 MHz are allowed within the 5 GHz band. 
However, they are not always practical. Larger channel widths have the potential for larger bandwidth, but not all clients will support the larger channel widths. Typically, enterprise deployments will use 40 MHz wide channels with high density areas still being restricted to 20 MHz wide channels. Dynamic Frequency Selection, or DFS, is designed to detect radar and is part of a detection and avoidance system for military, weather, and other types of radar, which may be operating within the 5 GHz band so as to avoid interfering with that radar. DFS use is regulatory domain specific and may be defined regionally on 5 GHz channels while other regions may not allow it at all. DFS performs the following functions when in use. Quieting the current channel for testing, testing for radar before using and while operating on the channel, discontinuing operations after detecting radar, detecting radar in current and other channels, requesting and reporting measurements in the channels using action frames and elements. If the DFS radar exists in that space and the AP detects it, it's going to determine a new channel for use on normal vendor proprietary channel selection algorithms while also factoring in DFS measurement information and channel support information received by clients during association. Newer clients support the use of DFS channels, while many older clients may not. The ability or inability to use these channels will impact your overall channel plan. ChannelFly is a ruckus proprietary technology that measures the performance of wireless LANs across all available channels. With ChannelFly, the AP intelligently samples different channels while using them for service. ChannelFly assesses channel capacity every 15 seconds and changes channel when, based on historical data, a different channel is likely to offer a higher capacity than the current channel. Each AP makes its own decisions based upon the historical data and maintains an internal log of channel performance. When ChannelFly changes the channels, it utilizes 802.11h channel change announcements to seamlessly change channels with no packet loss and minimal impact to performance. The 802.11h channel change announcements affect both wireless clients and ruckus mesh nodes in the 2.4 and or 5 GHz band. When initially deployed in the first 30 to 60 minutes, there will be more frequent channel changes as ChannelFly learns the environment. However, once an AP has learned about the environment and which channels are most likely to offer the best throughput potential, channel changes will occur less frequently unless a large measured drop in throughput occurs. ChannelFly can react to large measured drops in throughput capacity in as little as 15 seconds. Band balancing, load balancing, and band steering are methods available that help to maximize wireless LAN performance. Band balancing spreads the client devices across the available bands of 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. Load balancing spreads the load across available access points. Band steering will direct dual band clients to use 5 gigahertz and the percentage of clients that are directed is configurable within the system. Dynamic bandwidth operation is defined in the 802.11 standard as a feature of a very high throughput station in which the request to send clear to send exchange using non high throughput duplicate physical layer protocol data units negotiates a potentially reduced channel width compared to the channel width indicated by the request to send for subsequent transmissions within the current transmission opportunity. That's a mouthful. More simply put, a 20 MHz channel width is used so that all FIs understand the transmission and can use the channel width as 802.11a can only use a single 20 MHz wide channel. However, 802.11n can go up to 40 MHz wide while 802.11ac and ax can go as wide as 160 MHz. 
and high-density deployment networks try to use as wide a channel as possible, but more often than not, you're going to wind up remaining in 20 megahertz size and a high-density environment to reduce the collision domain sizes. When using dynamic bandwidth operation channel widths, they're dynamically set based upon what the APs detect within their airspace. If the noise on a given channel goes away, it may begin to use the space and increase the channel size.